Am I in the center of the frame? Probably. Do I look okay? Who knows? We'll just figure it out as we go. All right. And then we're gonna slam that record button and I'm gonna do a little clap, <laughs> clap. In previous videos on this channel, we talked about how we generate ringing and various call progress tones that were used on the old telephone network. We did a partial teardown of the P-type ringing machine, and we talked about how the 20 hertz bell ringing is generated and how the tone alternator works. Well, all of that was really in preparation for this because we finally have a proper ringing and tone plant here in the museum and I'm so excited to show it to you. But first, let's quickly review why this one is so special. In the classic telephone network, there were different ways to generate call progress tones, like busy signal, dial tone, and others. Depending on the manufacturer of the switching equipment and the age of the equipment in the office, your telephone experience could have sounded pretty different. In the museum, for example, we've been running a mostly solid state tone plant that was used for small step-by-step -step or number five crossbar offices. This tone plant is more than enough for our needs. Despite our large switching systems here, we don't really process nearly enough calls to actually warrant an upgrade. So it works fine, but the tones it generates aren't really correct for our number one crossbar and panel machines. They were installed in large cities, along with very particular heavy duty tone and ringing machines. These had a certain set of tones that were always associated with big cities. The existing small plant has all of those tones too, but they sound different, especially the ringback. Because of this, our switches never had that big city sound that they had while in actual service. Now, a few years ago, a friend of ours on the East Coast offered us a real city tone plant known as the 803C. This 803C was originally installed in Hartford, Connecticut in the 1960s and was removed sometime in the 1980s. After being removed, it sat in our friend's warehouse for another 30 years or so, and he figured it was probably one of the only examples of this type of ringing plant left in the country. So in 2021, Astrid and I traveled to his warehouse to disassemble it, load it into a moving truck, and drive it back to Seattle. Along with the equipment, he also gave us two lockers full of spare parts, which we were very thankful to have. The only problem was that back in Seattle, we didn't have anywhere to put this equipment in the museum. There was just no space. This is actually always a problem for us and we have enough equipment and storage to open up an entire second museum. So the ringing stuff sat there for two more years while we worked on other projects and tried to find room for it. While we were waiting for some space to materialize, we got a tip that an older ringing machine, just the machine, not the control equipment, was sitting on the floor in a basement in a central office nearby. I was super excited to go get it, so I asked permission from the manager of these buildings to enter the office and remove the old equipment. This one wasn't in great shape. It had obviously been heavily used, some parts were missing, and I bet that they were scavenged for use in other machines. Still, it was, at the time, the only example that I had seen of one of the older machines outside of the big one at our museum. So we grabbed it and we took it back with us, at least for parts. A month later, while I was telling someone about that neat find, they pointed out that there was another CO with these old machines still in the basement on their table bolted to the floor and that I should ask about these as well. So after some more text messages to technicians and managers, I was able to go and see them for myself and they were magnificent. It looked like someone had just turned them off and walked out of the room. Most of the control hardware had already been scavenged, 
but the machines themselves had remained untouched, probably because they were so insanely heavy and nobody in their right mind wanted to move them. And that's how I decided to move several thousand pounds of machinery out of a basement. I assembled a team of similarly insane people to come to the CO and help. We started by labeling all of the wires and carefully pulling them apart as best we could. We then brought in an engine hoist and raised the machines off of their tables and onto specially made dollies. After that was over, we disassembled the tables and we carried them out as well. And into storage they went. Even after all of this work, we still had to just put them in there because there was no room in the museum for any of this stuff. So we ended up with six ringing machines. The big one, which we've had forever and doesn't really work, the two 1960s ones from Hartford that our friend gave us, the one in bad condition from the floor, and the two AC and DC machines that were in great condition. Now, as much as I wanted to, it wouldn't be possible to bring all of these machines into the museum. So I had to decide which ones to actually use here. This process involved lots of thinking and took quite a long time. I could try to get the big machine working, but that would be extra complicated because there was just too much that would have to be fixed or adjusted in order to get it to do anything. I could use the 1960s machines that our friend gave us, along with the rest of the hardware, and that would be the easiest choice, since those machines were already connected to those control frames, so we knew that it would just work. My only problem there was that I didn't think the 1960s machines made by General Electric looked quite as nice as the older ones. Sure, they did exactly the same thing, and they worked in a very similar way but they were very modern and all the moving parts were hidden away behind the casings. So after some thought, I came to the conclusion that this wouldn't provide quite the same experience for us and our guests, even though the sounds would be exactly the same. So this left me with the two machines that were pulled out with their table. They were from the 1920s and they had the old construction style that really showed off the inner workings. I'm not gonna lie, I also just thought they were really pretty. But would they work again, and would they work with the newer control hardware that we got from Hartford? Turns out the answer was maybe. The old and new machines worked on similar principles, but in practice, the machines and the power boards were not mixed together. Each type of machine had its very own board, and when they came out with the new General Electric type, they updated the board along with it. The board itself contains the control and distribution circuits for the machines, so we would have to check each circuit for compatibility and make changes where needed. Finally, we had to choose whether to use the AC or the DC-driven machine. These were always used in pairs. So if the AC machine went down, the DC machine would take over right away. On the old pair, the AC machine was definitely the more worn out of the two since it ran almost continuously for 50 years. The DC machine, on the other hand, ran very rarely and was essentially new old stock. After taking a vote, we decided to go with the DC machine. Not only was it in better shape, but it also had these really neat contactors on the back of the power board that made a satisfying kerchunk when they're activated. And who doesn't like that? Now, we had to move some things around to make room for the equipment. This area of the museum hadn't really been touched since I started volunteering here, so it was quite a project to figure out what to do with everything. The first thing that had to go was these smaller ringing machines here. They are lovely, but we've never run them and we barely ever talk about them to visitors. The second thing we had to do was get rid of this cube right here. This was built for the museum and it just contained various power board panels that looked cool, 
But since they won't ever really do anything on their own, it was time for it to go. And yeah, the power board looks so much better now. Matt also cleaned up the wiring behind it as well, so it's actually less of a rat's nest. The next step was to actually load the equipment into the museum. Part of that were the frames of equipment that controlled the ringing machines themselves. And come to think of it, it might be nice to talk about them a little as we struggle to fit them in the elevator. See. These ringing machines are just one part of the full system. This set of three frames does all the rest. For one thing, it controls the motor start for both the AC and DC machines. In normal operation, only the AC machine would be run, and this machine would provide service the vast majority of the time. But if this board detects an output frequency or voltage failure on the AC machine, it can start the DC machine and transfer the load there all without human intervention. These large transfer switches can be operated automatically or manually and transfer the office load as needed. Other systems on the board call in alarms as other irregularities are detected. There are also regulators that automatically adjust the field voltage as the load on the machine goes up and down throughout the day. There are two of them here, one for each of the machines. After wrestling the equipment into the building, we started to move the frames into their final positions on the floor. We had already measured for this, so there was no big surprises here. Then Matt, Colin, and I worked to reattach the equipment that was removed in order to get these things into the elevator. <laughs> 